Good evening, everyone. I'm Amanda Hunt, Director of Education and Curator of Programs here at MOCA. I'm so happy tonight to welcome artists Zoe Leonard and Greg Bordowitz uh, to MOCA. We were fortunate enough to be able to reschedule the evening, and I'm very thankful for that opportunity, Zoe and Greg. On the occasion of Zoe Leonard's survey, the first large-scale overview of Leonard's work in an American museum, I wanted to create a program in honor of this incredible exhibition looking across uh, Leonard's career alongside another voice who's been so present um, throughout a three-decade period of production for both artists. Uh, Greg Bordowitz is that voice. Survey co-organized by MOCA senior curator Bennett Simpson and former MOCA curatorial assistant Rebecca Madelon highlights Leonard's engagement with a range of themes, including gender and sexuality, loss and mourning, migration, displacement, and the urban landscape. Her work in photography and sculpture has been celebrated for its lyrical observations of daily life, coupled with a rigorous questioning attention to the politics and conditions of image making and display. Simultaneously, uh, her peer and friend, artist and writer Greg Bordowitz, has generated performance and literary works about sexuality, death, and the AIDS crisis. Tonight marks a very special moment in which uh, their long-standing dialogue is made public in order to parse through Zoe Leonard's works, uh, both on view and over time. Before I bring these two to the stage, their bios. Greg Bordowitz is an award-winning artist, writer, and activist. His most recent exhibition, Greg Bordowitz, I Want to Be Well, a retrospective of 30 years of work, was exhibited last fall at the Cooley Art Gallery at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. His films, including Fast Trip, Long Drop, A Cloud in Trousers, The Suicide, and Habit, have shown internationally in screenings and exhibitions at museums, including the New Museum in New York, Artist Space New York, Tate Modern London, MoMA New York, and the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. Bordowitz is the author of many books, including The AIDS Crisis is Ridiculous and Other Writings, 1986 to 2003, Glenn Ligon, Untitled I Am a Man, General Idea Image Virus, Volition, and Tenement. Bordowitz has written numerous catalog and journal essays on art, literature, AIDS, and their intersections. He was a member of the groundbreaking AIDS activist group ACT UP and a founding member of the 1980s collective Testing the Limits. In 2006, Bordowitz received the Frank Jewett Mather Award for Art Journalism from the, I just lost my place, from the College Art Association and has been a recipient of a Rockefeller Intercultural Arts Fellowship, as well as a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship. A longtime faculty member of the Independent Study Program at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, Bordowitz is the director of the Low Residency Master of Fine Arts Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He has a forthcoming retrospective at the Art Institute of Chicago in April of this year. Zoe Leonard lives in New York City. She is an artist who works primarily with photography and sculpture and has exhibited extensively since the 1980s including solo exhibitions at the Museum of Contemporary Art here, the Whitney Museum of American Art New York, the Museum of Modern Art New York, Chinati Foundation Marfa, the Camden Arts Center in London, the Reina Sofia in Madrid, Dia Beacon in upstate New York, the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, Ohio, Photo Museum Winterthur, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Kunsthalle Basel, Secession Vienna, and the Renaissance Chicago, Society in Chicago. Group exhibitions include Documenta 9, Documenta 12, and the Whitney Biennials in 1993, 1997, and 2014. Publications include Analog, 20, 2007, Zoe Leonard Photographs in 2008, and You See I Am Here After All in 2010, uh, in addition to Available Light and Survey uh, of 2018. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Zoe Leonard and Greg Borderwitz to the stage. Hi, I'm Greg, that's Zoe. And um, thank you for that very warm introduction. Thank you for having us. Thank you to Mocha. Um, it's a really great pleasure to be here to talk with my longtime friend, Zoe Leonard, uh, about art. Because um, we could just as easily talk about shoes, if you'd like to hear about that. Um, but we'll talk about art. And um, Zoe, would you like to say a few words before we start? Sure. Um, hi, Greg. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, 
I know I keep hearing how it's been this like crazy uh, time in LA with all the fairs and that everyone's exhausted and sick of art. Um, so thank you for coming out today and um, for that beautiful introduction. And, um, um, and thank you to all of MOCA for the whole experience of making the show here and having the show here. It's been a, it's been a, a, a long and really um, interesting process. And um, thanks for that. So, yeah. Um, so I thought I would lay out, Zoe and I have talked previously, and I thought I'd lay out some of the ideas or categories uh, around which we'll discuss Zoe's work. And um, then we'll go through some of the slides, the PowerPoints, uh, further discussing these categories. I just thought when I, you know, Zoe and I have never actually had a public conversation before, but although we've been talking for 30 years and we have, I've written about Zoe's work and Zoe's contributed photographs to publications that I've done, so it's a great opportunity um, to have a discussion uh, in front of people that doesn't concern shoes. Um, so curiosity. It occurred to me that it, you can't have a conversation with Zoe without talking about her curiosity. I think curiosity is the basis of uh, all of her work. Uh, the works, the photos, sculptures, installations all originate in Zoe's predisposition to wonder, curiosity, and even awe. And um, perhaps later we'll talk uh, further about this idea that I'm interested in that Zoe's work gives testament to a kind of radical amazement. And we can talk about what radical amazement is or what it would be or what it is in relationship to Zoe's work. Also, uh, Zoe's work is about observation itself as an experience. Uh, each image or sculpture is about the medium itself, including the physiology of perception. There's a preoccupation with the physiology of perception and that produces a tension in the viewer between lyricism and materialism. That tension is the, es the essence of the ambiguity in the work. Uh, lyricism and materialism are often thought of as being irreconcilable concepts, but they're not, I would say. And by opposing them um, as seemingly opposite tendencies, uh, they can be resolved into affinities. And that's actually the driving force or formula behind romantic poetry. Actually, if you read Empson's Seven Types of Ambiguities, all seven types of ambiguities uh, stem from posing two things that seem to be opposite but are not that get resolved uh, through attention uh, in the work itself. So I would throw that out there as something I want to talk to Zoe about. Patterns, series, and repetition. Uh, like Gertrude Stein, uh, Zoe Leonard's work uh, uses patterns, series, and repetitions that arise from the artist's Zoe's bodily drives rather than pure mathematical calculation and sequencing. So I think we can talk about that and uh, some of the works that are right outside the door here in terms of what's driving the series. And composition is the key term to discuss all of the works as a unity. And by composition, I mean composition as matter, composition as material, and composition as relation. So we can start by looking at slides of uh, Zoe's work, many of the works that are here, and many of the works that were in New York, and some works that have been shown uh, in both or in either places, and um, we'll continue to talk as we look at the work. Do you have anything that you would like to say at this point? <laughs> no, I'm good, thanks. Okay. So I wanted to include this because uh, this is the, the first work of Zoe's I ever saw at Artist Space uh, in a show. It was a, a witness uh, to our vanishing. No, it was, it was what, what Artist Space show was it? Was, it was one of their selection, selections show, selections from the artist file, like okay. from their slide file. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'm mistaken, because I 
it's a long time ago, the 80s, and they, it all kind of condenses together. So that's how memory works. Yeah, I mean, we could, or not works. Yeah, we could, <laughs> we could make it be from that show. No, no, we should, we should be historically accurate. It was not that show. Um, and now for something completely different. All of a sudden, I thought I was on an episode of Monty Python. Um, anyway, I, I love this uh, uh, work. It's the first work, and it was great to see in New York that these works to walk in and look and see, oh yeah, that's, those are the first works I saw of Zoe's and they, they really perplexed me and they have a lot of the qualities of, that I'd like to talk about, uh, about works that are here and subsequently. Uh, for example, they're a diptych. Zoe works very, particularly with diptychs and I think in a particular way. Um, it's two photographs, but they're not identical. They're two different photographs of a seemingly same subject, but they're two completely different photographs. And you can think of them as a rhythm, you can think of them as a diastole and systole, which are the two movements of the heart. You can think of them as a, a jump, jump cut. There's a lot of different ways to think about how Zoe Leonard uses diptychs in her work. And there are a lot of diptychs in this show. I wanted to show this work too because uh, Zoe and I were really good friends by the time she was doing this work, but I learned that Zoe was driven by curiosity because we were hanging out and she said, oh yeah, I'm going to Vienna tomorrow. I have to take the photo, these photos of these wax, this wax anatomical model. Um, and I just thought, nah, no way. Actually, she did. She just, like, she just got on a plane with her camera and decided that she was gonna go. And that's when I realized that Zoe was genuinely driven by um, s curiosity and seeking um, inquiry and amazement. And she came back with these amazing photos of uh, this wax anatomical figure. Stop me anytime. <laughs> And these works uh, are really amazing too. I think that we, we're used to seeing these, uh, at least I'm used to seeing these. I was just telling Zoe that I, on a walk through Brooklyn, I thought of her photographs because I saw a whole bunch of trees growing through their chain link fences. Um, and I was, I've always thought about how these photographs are a marker of uh, duration, a certain amount of time when the, the growth of the tree exceeds its boundaries and constraints. Uh, and um, it, that's also a kind of amazement or awe. It's a, it, kind of, it seems like a beautiful metaphor. It is a beautiful metaphor. It's also, uh, again, a kind of record of history of growth. There also, there's the figurative element as well. I think a lot of Zoe's photographs have um, an allusive char character. They do refer to the figure. They do refer to the human body, the way the human body accommodates its surroundings or incorporates its surroundings. This is definitely a theme if you look within the frame of the work. I think there's two, a couple of different ways to look at Zoe's work. You can look at it, you could mine it for content, which is what we often do for photographs, but I think that it's always also about the medium as well, that you're always looking at a photograph. In fact, I think that the prompt of all of Zoe's photographs is what are you looking at? That's the question that the photograph poses to the viewer. What are you looking at? And often the answer is, a photograph. Yes, you're looking at a tree, you're looking at a wax anatomical model, but you're always looking at a photograph of these things and made aware that it's the photographic medium that is really being presented as a subject to ponder. Do you, should I say something? You can I, <laughs> hey, stop me. Please stop me. No, I don't want I don't want to stop you. Um, but I was going to say to you that Sorry? You want to stay on that image? Sure, yeah. Um, that I do think that's a really big 
th this last thing about presenting the photograph and reminding you that it's a photograph, asking you to consider it as such, that it's not a window or a mirror, it's not a, um, it isn't a part of the real world, it's a made, it's a constructed, um, uh, it's a constructed work. Um, and I think the other question that goes with that is where are you looking from? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, by leaving the black frame in, which I almost always do, um, is a way of reminding you that, again, that it is a construction and that a part of that, that the, the ostensible subject is only part of the equation. It's also about your particular vantage point and your point of view. So it, it's, it's a dynamic relationship um, that seeing being in the world um, is both a, a receptive and a projecting activity. You're, you're looking out at the world and you're projecting your ideas and your biases and your, um, you're seeing things from where you stand and then you're also receiving what's there. So um, a lot of these other things that you were saying about wanting to have um, uh, different elements that are in conflict with each other or to pose more than one um, I guess the, uh, the photographs aren't about harmony the work isn't about things arriving into a harmony it's um, more often about um, uh, recognizing all the composition of, of dissonance and of things having um, of, of many separate elements that don't necessarily all cohere. Um, and for me, that's also maybe about a process of asking you to think and feel at the same time or to recognize that we're all always thinking and feeling at the same time, that they're not separate things, that it's not just like, oh my God, that's so beautiful, that you're, and to sort of not, to allow visual pleasure to happen, because I love visual pleasure and I, and I don't want to deny that to my viewer, I don't want to take away the image and have it be really dry, but I also, want to be able to to think about the process of seeing while we're seeing um, and how that how that process of seeing is it's not only an optical exercise it's um, it results in emotional responses and it results in in political responses it results in all of these other things that we feel. It's not just an, a kind of an optics of how things look. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to say something about the, the wax anatomical model story, which is totally true. Um, how, you, how quickly it happened. Um, they, yeah, we, we don't even need to. It's, it's more of an anecdote. But I was walking down Houston Street and I ran into Kiki Smith, who used to live in the neighborhood, and I think she still does live, I don't live in that neighborhood anymore. But Kiki had just come back from Vienna, and she had this uh, guidebook to Vienna in her bag, and she was just really excited about her trip, and she was like, you've gotta go to Vienna. And I was like, oh, like I'd never thought about Vienna at all. Like, it, Vienna had never even occurred to me as a place. Um, and, but I, she gave me this guidebook, and I went home and I looked at it and I saw a photograph, a color photograph in the guidebook of this wax anatomical model. And I had been kind of struggling at that time in, um, I'd been doing a lot of the aerial photography and I was a very like dedicated, committed artist, but I was really, and I was also in ACT UP, and I was doing AIDS activism and thinking a lot about um, medical history and whose bodies are um, 
respected and protected and whose bodies get to be healed and who who counts like you know so I'd been thinking a lot about like the politicized body and I'd been kind of struggling to make a leap in my own work that somehow um, dug into some of the things I was thinking about in my activism and when I saw this image um, of this wax anatomical model. Um, these models are, um, they were made in the, you're gonna help me with this, 17th century? Yes. Um, whenever I, I don't. I the data over there, but that's, yeah, I that's know when that. you took the photo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, this particular one is in the uh, medical museum, the Friedrich, uh, the Friedrichianum, I think. Yeah. Sounds right. No, the Josephinum. The Josephinum. Right. Emperor Joseph. Um, uh, so they were they were made at a time when it wasn't legal to dissect corpses to teach medical students. They had to learn surgery and they had to learn anatomy through using these wax anatomical models. And the fact that this wax anatomical model presented the female body in such a specific way um, struck me as an incredibly visceral example of how women's bodies are treated as um, um, essentially, you know, for reproduction only and kind of fetishized even within like supposedly the science of medicine where everyone is supposed to be, like that's where you're supposed to get help to be well, to, you know. And the pearls were sort of the, that was the, I, I was like, whoa. And something about everything I'd been thinking about in ACT UP and what we'd been fighting for, which is kind of this legacy that is, you know, built into the medical system, which is, you know, connected to the pharmaceutical, connected to politics, connected to money, connected to government, that all of the institutionalized sexism and racism and classism and all of that was so built in. And I was like, this is still f fucking happening now. It just, this says it visually. And so I had this like, one of those things of like, I gotta go, I gotta go. And I literally, I went to my bank on Avenue A. I think I had $700. I bought a plane ticket um, and like emptied the bank account and was just like, I'm going to Vienna <laughs> like tomorrow. <laughs> and did, I spent like a couple of days like squeaking around the old rusty floorboards of this museum where there were signs everywhere of like the camera symbol with a um, slash through it and so like waiting for the guard to go away and then like dragging this chair over and standing up on the chair and getting the picture and hearing the guard's footsteps and putting the chair back and like you know um, so yeah it was a it was a sudden movement but it was one of those moments and that this led to a couple of years I guess of work of really um, I had photographed in natural history museums before, but this gelled something for me, and I, I spent several years really working in a lot of medical history museums. Um, the Museum of Beauty, also here in Los Angeles, I'm not sure if it's still here, but um, whoa, fab, like fantastic and creepy, um, Re Revlon. Um, uh, and sort of um, kind of um, trolling the, these older museums for, a, um, I'm not sure I could quite use the word evidence, but, but kind of all of this like physical manifestation, these objects that manifested so clearly their bias and that this is what we'd been, this is how we learned. Like this, it, we're not, we weren't, we weren't far enough away, we're still not far enough away. And I was like, this is, um, so yeah, it led to a whole other body, a body of work, which, of which there are s several examples here in the show. Right. And the theme of travel and observation is something that's consistent with your work, especially from 
that earlier period, the photographs of looking out of the airplane windows, the aerials. At the same time, around the same time, when you had no money, you were saving money to go up in helicopter rides so you could take the aerials. Um, you were totally driven to um, exercise your curiosity about the world. And, and the photographs often thematize your act of looking as well. So the compos I was really amazed at the compositions you came back with from Vienna because it's, you didn't try to shoot through the glass in a way that you were seeing the model. It was always very important that you were actually framing the model within its glass enclosure. Do you want to talk about that more? Or? Um, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I don't know how to say this. Um, I, f I think whenever I set out to make something, and I think this might be true of most artists, you have this like crystal clear, really great idea in your head of this really amazing thing you're going to make. And, um, and then you go to try to make it, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's not, go it's not going very well at all. Um, in this particular case, I wanted to basically photograph the um, photograph. I wanted the photograph that was in the guidebook, basically. Um, I later actually photographed the guidebook. Um, but I wanted to get like a clean, good picture. And uh, the cases were high. There were hundreds and hundreds of cases there. Um, all but one represented male bodies. Um, about 99% of them were standing and not prone. Um, this was the only supine figure with like a silk bed and pearls on. Um, you know, there were things about the, you know, the skeletal system, the muscular system, whatever. But in terms of photographing, I was like, oh, how do I get up there? And, and then I was with this chair, you know, the dance with the chair and the guard. Um, and the, I wanted like, and then it was like warping away because it's kind of big and I wanted like a nice picture. And it was not, it was, they were coming out crooked and weird and I was in a hurry because I kept hearing the guard. And um, when I got the contact, when I got the work home and I processed the film and made contact sheets and I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't know about these. Like I think these are, this, they were so fucked up and messy and like, you know, all off angle. And um, then I photographed the guidebook. Um, and it, this, this period of time, it was a, a, a period of time where a lot of things were shifting in the work where I started to recognize that that, uh, that this sort of akimbo, strange position or excuse me, the not perfect image was actually was what I was interested in and that um, I wasn't actually interested in the, that I kept thinking that my own process was getting in the way and suddenly I realized it wasn't getting in the way at all and that actually that was part and parcel of what I was trying to make and that I didn't, I didn't want to take like a clean industrial shot. I tried to, but I wasn't able to, but then I, I was like, no, I don't, I don't want that set of skills. I don't, I don't want to make a, per, you know, a sort of like um, an advertising shot. Um, a similar thing had happened with the airplane window photographs. Um, I had, was always trying to get a, a really like a good picture of the landscape and the the window is always in the way and the way the edge of the window goes blurry and then the window frame would come in and I was like, oh, damn it. And I took this one picture, it's in here somewhere, we'll come across it, where I didn't manage to get an aisle, a, a window seat and so I was shooting from across the aisle and there's like a blurry headrest and 
when I processed them, I was like, that was the one I got the most interested in. And the obstruction to the vision actually became interesting. And through that series of photographs, the ones I ended up working with were the ones where you actually see the window. And I realized that was, that was where my own, the, the vantage point of the photographer, it's where I become obvious. It's where this isn't an authoritative, anonymous voice coming from somewhere. This isn't some kind of downloading of truth or reality. This is, I'm, I'm a person with a camera taking a picture from somewhere. And there are, there's a whole lot of intercession and mediation between yourself and how you represent the world. And, and, I, and, and through a number of these kinds of accidents or failures where I couldn't take a good picture, basically led me to be like, oh, that's actually my material. That actually is what it, that's what I want to really dig into. And uh, like when I started printing the wax anatomical ones, I put in the title, you know, from below or shot crooked from above. And I started titling um, something that was a, a dynamic relationship rather than calling it the thing that is the subject. It was recognizing, um, yeah, recognizing that activity between this, the subject and me. Um, so we're way off track now. We're no, we're saying, not. There's we're no good. track. There's we're no fine. track. There's no yeah. track. There's always uh, shoes. I was, uh, I was looking through the slides not to distract you when you were talking, but I, I thought I didn't remember where the airplane, looking out of the airplane photos were, but I did land on this next slide, and I thought maybe we could talk about, uh, extend uh, what we're talking about or what you're talking about in relationship to these photographs. Um, they're obviously nature photographs, but they're also, they thematize uh, the f natural photography as well. So I wonder if you would talk a little, little bit about, about that. Could, could you say more about that actually? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, it's, well, this was like, this, when was this, 2001, that's much later. Um, I, that's a kind of a, un, un articulated thought, but I was just thinking that there was this period where we were all just referring to the tree as the sign. Remember that? Uh, this, you're probably, um, maybe some of you don't remember this, but when semiotics was really big, we always had to explain what the sign was, and the sign was that the, the, uh, the, signif the, the, <laughs> the signifier is the image of the tree, or the word tree, and the signified is the actual photosynthesizing plant in the world and that the um, uh, referent is the, would be the first tree, which doesn't exist. So that was called the crisis of the referent, which was, that was actually never a first tree. And uh, you notice I said tree, but we didn't, I didn't say uh, birch or maple or elm. Uh, which also equally problematizes the notion of the signified. So the signifier tree actually is this open and valent sign, which leads on to any number of associations. So um, <laughs> then, of course, we can talk about the tree as yeah. an Edenic symbol. Um, I really missed that whole chapter. <laughs> you missed that whole actually. chapter. No. Right, exactly. I, you like, were not, I didn't read any of that. You were that not or... rocking that so semiotics. So you weren't thinking about semiotics at, no. at this time. Well, what were no. you thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I thinking about? Huh? Could, we, could you click back? There's three of these, right? I think here. Yeah, this was the first one. So we go from the trees yeah. growing out growing out of their container. Um, of course, there's no relationship between the, uh, the fence and the tree. The, one is not containing the other, but they become interrelated and relational once their space intersects. Um, but they don't recognize each other. They're not built for each other. They're not. Um, but here we have these open air photographs. You spent a lot of time. 
you travel to Alaska, so there's a lot of photographs coming up in the slideshow, as well as photographs in the show, which are about the, the relationship of you to the natural environment. Um, and I, I often thought about what's, are they different? Is, are, they, uh, are the photographs that Zoe takes in the quote unquote natural environment different than the urban environment or not? I see you applying the same kinds of formal principles and rules. I mean, there, there are really few works where there isn't a sign mm -hmm. of man, of human intervention. Mm -hmm. Even like the third one of these, um, if you click to the, I think it's the third one, yeah, like there, um, you know, this like electric pole thing is in the, in the electric meter or mm -hmm. something. Um, it's, it's, it's really rare that um, uh, the waters are one, but there are very few pictures um, where um, that are just like, behold nature, you know, behold beauty. Um, most of the time it's um, a more um, the kind of um, spaces where um, human culture or civilization um, ties into or is bound into and with um, the natural world. Um, and I think that's a whole kind of really complicated thing that we could talk about for a long time. You know, are we separate from the natural world? We're part of the natural world, maybe our, um, uh, not the people in this room necessarily, but um, sort of um, the, the human tendency to define themselves as separate from nature, maybe part of, you know, what accounts for the fact that it's like, you know, snowing here and like that there are fire, you know, like this lack of uh, recognizing the kind of, um, um, interrelatedness of different species um, and questions of hierarchy I think travel through all of my work um, the the um, the manufacturing of category and hierarchy that's I think a theme that runs throughout um, the that the first one that one um, the red apple tree one um, is one of the few moments that was just like wow that's so gorgeous um, I was like walking in the uh, uh, the I think the two two images ago but it's we don't need to go back there um, I was just visiting some friends upstate and it was very 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 cold there'd been an early frost and um, we were walking, coming back from a long hike through the woods, and there was like this a little bit of a clearing, and this one tree with just bright red apples, and everything else was barren in winter. And it was such a stunning image. Um, I went, I didn't have a camera, I went back to the city, I called them up the next day, and was like, hey, would you guys mind if I came back? And went back, um, hoping like there wouldn't be a wind, and the apples wouldn't all blow away um, and I was just interested really the the beauty and this sort of maybe the two things here are this imagery that are is a sign or, of or symbol of fecundity and richness and sweetness and fruit food um, and the kind of barrenness it was such a startling contrast um, uh, and then later, after I printed this, it was the first dye transfer print I ever made. I also, as I learned more about apples and trees and orchards, apples aren't naturally occurring in um, this country. They're everywhere there's an apple tree in this country, it actually is a sign of human intervention. And usually in upstate New York, if you have an apple tree, kind of um, an older apple tree, kind of in the middle of a woods, it was usually um, part of a homestead or a farm. So um, these kinds of themes of 
of, um, I don't know, like, uh, like richness or fertility or like the intensity of the color red and the fruit and then the barren or sense of abandonment, that kind of contrast was something I was interested in. Um, but I want to segue a little bit to the way the show is laid out. And I think in the layout of the exhibition, the decisions about the installation here, um, this, the show here, and we might talk about this a little bit more later on, but the exhibition survey, when it was in its iteration in New York and its iteration here are two completely different shows, really. Um, there are some crossover pieces, but they're installed very differently. It's a different selection of work. And here, I really took my cues from this building, as I did at the Whitney, and um, the kind of uh, the structure of the roof, the kind of um, uh, the, the way that the, this building is constructed, how that's so evident. And so the tree, that sculpture, became a really central feature of the installation here. And a lot of the other galleries kind of um, play off of that or respond to that. And I wanted some of those access points. I didn't want there to be an overly simplified idea of like, this is culture and this is nature. So the way some of those galleries lead into and out of each other um, were meant to push into the questions around how we, how we behave as animals, like as part of the natural world and the kind of interrelationships between urban life and rural life and how they're not they're not so simple to sever. They're very interconnected with each other. Um, so. That's an excellent uh, connection and leap and brings us to other aspects that we wanted to talk about. But maybe we'll, we'll talk more about that, but maybe we'll go through some more of the slides. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but I just want to say this is a funny anecdote. I don't know if you remember this, but it, it kind of. Uh, <laughs> reveals something about our ongoing 30-year conversation. I remember when you uh, took this photo and it was in your studio, I did a studio visit and we talked about it for an hour and um, we had a really great conversation and then you said, Greg, it's amazing, we, we talked for the, about this photograph for like an hour and you didn't even mention the apples and, and I couldn't see them because I'm colorblind. So... <laughs> um, <laughs> Like the red defaults to the green, because um, I have a red green deficiency. Sweet TMI, maybe, but I, I just, I just thought it was interesting. Um, it was always a testament. To, I learned, like philosophically, I learned something about conversations that they're asymmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> we had an amazing conversation about something that neither of us were seeing in, in the same way at all, which brings us to the topic of the physiology of seeing. Um, which is what the uh, pinhole cameras are really about, I think. The, the, here, you, in your work, you're really thematizing the way we see. Not only uh, what are you looking at, not only where you're looking from, but how are we seeing is, becomes the, the subject of the work. And it's not just a simple pinhole camera. I know it's not because I've seen you install them. So you, you actually block out huge portions of the window and move the aperture around. And you also think a great deal about the lens that is going to be the aperture. And there's a tremendous amount of work um, because the um, because pinhole cameras are a hobby. People build them all over the world. But yours are very, very specific and very, very site specific. And, um, do you want to talk more about that with the physiology of seeing or? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, they're like, um, they, they do take months and months, years sometimes to fig figure it out. Um, but the idea is also not to, um, 
I get a lot of that labor out of the way so that to make, I'm just trying to create an experience. Um, uh, I do leave certain things, signs of the labor, like the windows I always plywood over and I don't paint it so that you can see that the window's blocked out. Um, I leave the, the structure. Um, uh, these, yeah. Um, I think I would go further than just saying the physiology of seeing. I think that the physiology or, of seeing is is a huge part of this, but I'm going to use this other word, experience or process, um, which are maybe much, I don't know, they're, they don't sound as sophisticated, but the, the optical process of how we see um, that light enters your pupil, falls on the um, your retina, you have cones, the image enters upside down, your brain is stimulated and flips the image around. Um, the, the process by which we see the world um, when it's laid bare for us um, or when you have the chance to experience yourself seeing something and um, it makes the world strange. Like you, um, you see it differently when you're made aware of that seeing. Um, you know, you, you've, you're very invested also in psychoanalytic theory. You've written a lot, you've read a lot in that realm. And I think one of the things in these camera obscura pieces, um, and they're actually camera obscuras, not pinhole cameras, although there's a relationship there. Um, is that you, when you first enter, uh, the room appears dark. You come in and you walk into a dark room and you, and you can't see anything. Um, sometimes you can see one little streak of light and it's as your eyes adjust, there's this incredible, um, you know, panoramic image. Um, and that darkness, that moment of darkness, um, which can be depending on the time of day and the lens, the aperture that I've made and the situation, it can be a few seconds, it can be minutes long before your eyes adjust enough to see the image. Um, that period of darkness, I think, is, a really inter is, is an integral part of these works where you're, um, you're in that, um, uh, psychological space that's before you can start to understand anything. You're in a kind of liminal space um, that is confusing and confounding and then when the image starts to appear it's upside down. It's not what you're used to. And so there's a whole or reorientation that happens that takes patience and can be you know, exciting, but scary or disorienting. And so I was also really interested in making these room-sized camera obscuras that people could occupy together and that we could go through that process together socially and have the, the normally very kind of private experience of, of sight as a shared experience, still different, still individual, no two people. I mean, <laughs> you're still not going to see the red, right? Um, but but we're, we're going through our process of seeing together. Um, and I, I was also really interested in the idea of getting rid of the object of the photograph, the whole idea of the record the record of the past, the record of this moment, um, the object that's saleable, the whole, to actually think about the potential um, for photography to be um, a time-based medium that is, as, that is ephemeral, that is um, like a performance, that is um, not quite cinema because it's not repeatable. There, the, these pieces, um, there's a series of six of them, and they're each named 
the title is the address where the lens is placed, not what you're looking at, but where you're looking from. Um, and they only exist for the duration of the exhibition. They exist for as long as they're up. And every single second of that run is different. Certain things happen, but the angle of the sun changes a little bit every day. The weather changes a little bit every day. In the one, the previous one, the Whitney one, I got this like hysterical call from the curator one morning because like the plum tree across the street had gone into blossom or the, the pear tree. The, and she was just like, oh my God, you have to come up right now. There's flowers on the ceiling. You know, and it was like, you're like, that's not something we thought about beforehand. And so, and it's also something that's going on and happening when the museum's closed. Um, it's, so it's an attitude towards art making that is, um, goes against the grain of things being reproducible or um, commodifiable or that a museum can deliver the same experience over and over again. Um, and so on a lot of levels, on the sort of the, the physio physiological experience you're having, the psychological experience you're having, and the social experience you're having. And um, to think about, yeah, to think about seeing as as all of those things, and that we're actually all doing that all the time, but but we're not always paying attention to it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was beautiful. Um, I think we should go through some photographs because I'm just mindful of time. How are you guys doing? Still want more talking? Okay, we'll talk for a little bit longer. Um, so here you do the opposite thing. You, you break every rule of how to make a good picture uh, by turning the camera onto the sun. You wear um, welding goggles or a welding helmet to take these photographs. Goggles would look too okay. The right. welding helmet you, is just you like, have like the full on flip down. Full on, yeah. Butch apparatus it's, thing. It's, yeah. yeah, no, I look like people cross the street like when I'm taking these pictures. Yeah. But the goggle, these are, this actually offers the best protection. Cause yeah, you can't actually look, you can't look at the sun. So yeah, me, 7 a.m., giant welding helmet, walking down, you know, walking through Williamsburg with my camera. People are literally like, oh, just stay away from that one. Right, no. they're, they're not about light, they are light. You know, <laughs> like you could talk about how Photographs are, are always about light, um, and uh, certainly the camera obscures are about light, but the, this is directly taking on the subject of light in a very literal way. Yeah. Um, and the, of course, I think these are amazing photographs, um, and they're beautifully installed here. I think the conjugation of the three rooms in the so-called bunk bunker is really amazing. Um, yeah, and I think the, these, I'm gonna go, quickly so we can get to some of the other things that we wanted to discuss, but if you want to interject in any way, let me know. But I, I think the mirrors are like the sun, and that, uh, or they're like the wall photos, and that the, you, you're, again, it's like, what are you looking at? Um, how is it not returning your gaze? And the mirror is supposed to return your gaze, but it's not. Um, uh, you're seeing the surface, the shine, the sheen, you're seeing the materiality of the mirror, the glass, um, and the, the, actually the, the material that the mirror shares with the camera itself, but um, it's not in any way functioning as the apparatus that it's supposed to be. Um, and here, again, are, that's the, I think that, I believe that's the photograph you were talking about where the um, seat, the seat is obscuring the view. Um, this is really also about wonder and scale. And it makes me also think about the bullfighter photograph, which is not in here, but um, how there's a, something at the, putative center of the photograph that's surrounded by a tremendous amount of uh, awe-inspiring landscape, but you don't forget 
the labor involved in maintaining, so for example, Niagara Falls or the, the, the orchard or, you know, these are things that are actually maintained, may either maintained as sites, heavily regulated um, as places of visitation or with regard to the tree and the landscape, the apple tree, how you talked about, there's actually an orchard where you're not looking at nature and um, you're, you're looking at something that's been tended, husbanded, hi uh, hybridized, etc. Um, so I think the, uh, radical amazement is different than the sublime uh, in that uh, this... Yeah, yeah, let's hear about radical amazement, <laughs> Greg. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, the sublime is the, the combination of um, uh, joy and horror captured in the same moment. And you could talk about these photographs as the sublime in, if you were inclined to do so. Um, but radical amazement is something that makes an impression on the witness, uh, which also stimulates curiosity, which also reaches down deep into the psychology of the viewer that produces a kind of sensation or a set of sensations. It's sensation driven. Radical amazement um, recognizes that uh, ideas are sensations. Um, it's not uh, a thought about the sublime, it's actually the experience of wonder. And so the photographs are amazing because they actually produce wonder as photographs, not because you're at Niagara Falls, but because you're actually looking at something that produces wonder as art. Um, and getting back into the diptych, again, the kind of the rhythm, I think another thing that your work does is like, look, look again, it's just kind of like double kind of look, look again, look, return. Um, and uh, now we're going all over the place, but the aerials also are about distance and looking down and maybe the omniscient view or the bird's eye view, God's eye view, but they're also not um, what one could call classically sublime natural vistas, right? Um, they, they, they bear a great resemblance to the map photographs in some way, or you're interested in, in cartography. Um, I love the ocean photos. Um, and now we're getting to this point where we're going to talk about series, patterns, and repetition. And I think that, 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 that it's, uh, the repetitions and patterns and say, uh, you see, I am here after all, or um, which is postcards, made up of postcards of Niagara Falls in patterns, um, sets up, achieves a rhythm and sets a rhythm, up a rhythm of look, look again, look again, look again. Um, but every time you return, it's different. Uh, so it's repetition with a difference, uh, which I think is significant. And um, uh, you manage to, this work in particular is spectacular because you manage to create a work that is both monumental and you have to take a step far back to try to encompass it all, but then you can't see the individual constituent parts, so you have to go in closer and engage in this kind of repetitious looking. Uh, I'm going fast just so we can get to some of the other things that we talked about. So but stop me if there's anything you want to interject. Um, same thing with this. I think this is a really interesting, This this is, interesting in relationship to the stacking photos, the books as well, because I think I look at it as both a kind of record and a, a, a minimalist project in that it takes a verb like stacking and actualizes it into a work of art. So it's, um, so it's like Andre or any number of people, um, or there's also Darboven. I mean, the, you have coordinates. There are historical coordinates um, that are interesting to me to think about in relationship to your work. Um, this piece, uh, 1961, which adds a, a suitcase for every year. It reminds me of Lynn Hyginian, the poet, uh, did a book where she did poems for every year that she was alive, and then she, it ended, and then she redid the book, adding <laughs> more poems for every additional year that she was live, alive, and then also other poems to add up to that. Um, 
How many people know that Lynn Hyginian book? I, yeah, I knew Bennett was going to raise his hand. It's a great book. I'm doing, an, I'm doing an advert for it. Lynn Hyginian, great language poet. Read her. Um, and this gets into repetitions again, the bird pictures, um, contact prints. We were walking through the show and we were talking about how there's different kinds of viewing that are thematized in Zoe's work. There's the stereoscopic, which is really the two, the two slightly different points of view um, in the diptychs. Then there's the cinematic um, ordering of uh, an entire role of uh, this film. Again. Yeah, maybe, um, could you actually go back one or two? Maybe, yeah, maybe to that one. Um, I want to lead into talking about the what you were just mentioned, this, the, the idea of the stereoscope and the diptych, but I want to start by talking about this a little bit. Um, uh, when we walked through the show together yesterday, we stopped in front of this one diptych and Greg said something that I'd never thought of before, but that was a super interesting read. Um, like he referred to one of the diptychs as, as stereoscopic. Um, and I'd really never thought about that before, but um, as a kind of way to talk about, get into that realm, um, the, this, these works are um, enlarged contact sheets and um, throughout my whole practice from very early on, I, in this attempt to kind of take, take, um, take a certain kind of picture but then ending up taking a different kind of picture, um, I often when I would tr go to print, it, I would be with this choice of which is the best one, which is the best one, and um, you know, editing and editing and, and printing, printing out 20 different ones and then choosing one. And certain, certain ideas couldn't seem to resolve in one photograph. Like there wasn't a way that that idea was gonna work as one photograph. And so I started doing these multi-part works really early. Sometimes they were five parts, sometimes they were seven part, and often diptychs. Um, and I think there's something really inherent about that. Um, it, and they're not, that's different from a series, like the tree and fence, that's a series of work that are related to each other. It's a body of work, but the waters, that's one work. And we'll segue from this to, if we have time, to these other works that are four and five part works. Um, that some of the contradiction or complexity or multiplicity of what I'm trying to talk about is precisely about how certain um, human experiences cannot gel into one perfect moment. They don't actually resolve into one harmonious, perfect thing that you can say, this is it. And that sort of flies in the face of a lot of the history of fine art photography, which was built around this idea of the decisive moment. And it's like, the, oh, that's it, you've captured it. This word capture, oh my God, it just oh, it makes me want to scream. Like, you're not capturing anything, or at least that's not what I want to do. I, the complexity of human experience of being alive, of being in love, of being um, in a complicated society with hundreds and millions of other people that think differently than you, and all of the complexity of the shared experience that we have, I just can't usually resolve it into like, this is it. And there are moments that crystallize, there are stories we can tell, um, but I, I think in my work it's often about these kind of push-pull experiences of um, contradiction, or in the, maybe we can go to the family photos. Yeah. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe we skip to the diptych, we can go back to that just for a second. 
Yeah. We were standing in front of one of these when Greg said this thing about this, the stereoscope. And um, as the like photo nerd that I am, I had just like last week or the week before gone with Fia Backstrom and Katie Hubbard, who started this um, totally nerdy club called the General Photography Group. So of course I signed up immediately. And we had just spent the day in Princeton looking at all these um, optical instruments and we looked at a lot of stereographs and uh, stereoscopes. And so in, with stereo, stereo, stereographic photography, you know, you're, you take two photographs that are a certain distance apart that mimic the distance of the human eyes, and then when you use a stereoscope, you're resolving those two images into one whole that then gives you the impression of a three-dimensional image. So they're about resolution, they're about creating harmony. They're actually about bringing that distance together and making a whole. Um, and I thought, God, that's so interesting. I've never thought about that aspect of why I use diptych so much and that I'm actually going for something that's completely counter to that. It's about the inability to make these two things resolve into one whole. It's a way of describing or making manifest the experience of dissonance, fracture, separation, disembodiment, um, or contradiction. Um, and I think it's uh, this last body of work that's upstairs on the mezzanine is probably the place where I worked with that language. Um, I took it the furthest. Um, like diptychs and multi-part works have always been part of it, but here I really, with that body of work, I used it to really make a language to um, explore um, uh, the idea of statelessness and displacement and the inheritance of um, traumatic experience um, you know, I'm a first generation um, American um, who I came from on my mother's side. They were refugees from the Second World War. And so that experience, the inheritance of that, when you grow up hearing or knowing but not knowing, um, that, that that is an experience that many people that live in this country share, or a lot of us have recent. Um, so, the idea of working with these family photographs um, but not trying to do the archival thing of saying, oh, here's the fact, here's the story, here's what happened, here it's all laid out, now we can understand it, like this is exactly what happened, I can name all the characters and these are the documents and da da da, -da. I was actually working to explore and try to find a visual language that talked about um, the way that those kinds of displacements um, do not necessarily resolve back into a whole that is then understandable. They remain fractured. And, you know, when Greg and I were having this conversation in front of one of the diptychs yesterday, and the stereoscope, and we were talking about this optical experience, and then Greg said, this, this isn't just happening in the eyes, it's happening in the body. And I was like, yes, that's exactly right. It's like, um, it's like the two halves of your body. It's about how movement, the, the skip, a jitter, um, in like this five-part work, I mean, the diptychs, I think, have a particularity because they really are about, like, internal binary in the human physiology um, and how, yeah, our movement. But here it's, like, looking, looking, like, what, what... These photographs, I'm not presenting the, the document of, like, this is the picture of this person. This is a, a photographic record of my looking at those things 
And then what am I looking for? Like, why do I keep looking back and forward? So trying to kind of replicate the way that we look for things in photographs and specifically in family photographs, um, uh, maybe looking for something they cannot possibly deliver um, or we accept what's in the photograph and that becomes a kind of myth or um, it crystallizes something but that isn't necessarily really reflective of the complexity of the whole situation that was happening. Um, so this, this idea of, this set of ideas um, around, came from a lot of experimentation in the studio with these photographs, shooting them with different I decided to just do everything against archival practice, like rather than using a copy stand and kind of regulating all the exterior conditions, the lighting, the background, and then trying to look at them as like evidence or archival material. I kept mo changing the backgrounds, I changed the cameras, I changed the film, I shot 6.7, I shot 35 millimeter. This was shot on my phone. Um, and so I was just, um, and also that having the phone ones in there because the, to sort of have almost that whole top gallery, or maybe half of it, is um, the yeah, other digital. Yeah, they're they shot on my phone. Um, and then there's you know obviously this really like the cam you know it's like the, and that's my mom and my grandmother or it's a. It's not my mom or my grandmother, it's a photograph of a photograph of my mom and my grandmother. Um, but yeah, looking for, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I just wanted to kind of, maybe we can end there or we can continue, but I was just wanted to uh, talk about some thoughts that we've discussed together and then maybe you can answer that and that would be the end. Um, but uh, this, this is, uh, I, I love the, these in particular, I love all of this in the wake series, but these in particular, they, they, these, the, this particular uh, suite reminds me of the mirrors or it reminds me of the walls. There are pictures of the walls in the gallery here. There's a gray wall and a red wall um, where it, the photograph is re really, the subject of the photograph is really the, the surface of the photograph or the surface of what's being photographed and uh, here is it's brought home to me most that this is um, not re-photography when I first saw in the wake in the studio I had this whole thing it's like oh I want to write an article about how Zoe's completely revolutionized re-photography and this is not Richard Prince's early work. This is not Sherry Levine's early work. This is not about appropriation. This is not about mining the content of what's inside the frame, like the Marlboro Man. This is not about authorship, like taking a photograph exactly to the scale of the photograph, the historical photograph, the Frederick Western or whatever. But there's no, I would drop the re, there's no re-photography here. This is a photograph. <laughs> Uh, and I think that's a really important thing to recognize that what's not, it's not a representation of anything. Uh, it is in it of itself um, another proposition or photographic proposition, uh, which I find to be really fascinating and uh, moving. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, should I talk about that a little bit, or you can we talk have about time? it? We have fun. We're fine. Okay. Um, yeah, I I completely agree. Like there, the impulse people use the phrase usually re photography in referring to this or writing about this work, um, and for me, um, the way I think of re photography is where you're you're really trying to replicate the image. And these, um, and, and, and usually one uses tools like the copy stand or something, you're trying to get, you're trying to replicate that image. And this is recognizing the photograph as an object, not only as an image. And so I'm 
I'm approaching it, I'm photographing it as I would photograph the tree or any other subject. It's, um, and it does have this layer of image within that object, and it's not about saying that that doesn't have meaning, but it's not, it's, um, the impulse isn't appropriation. It's, and it's not about, um, it doesn't have to do with, um, I mean, it also doesn't have to do with kind of the commercial language in that way. It comes out of a vernacular of um, amateur photography, of um, the pictures that um, people take of each other. And there is a whole commercial aspect to that too. But um, these are vernacular photographs, they're snapshots. Um, but yeah, it's, I think of them as photographs, not re-photographs. Um, in this particular one, this was the first work to, that I managed to resolve in the studio. I was working in the studio with these, um, you know, all of this material that I had, these boxes of old family photographs and a number of documents. And um, it's so funny, like by the time a show comes around, I tend to hang pretty spare and I boil things way, way, way down. Um, but it's shocking how much material I produce to get there. Like. It was like madness in the studio for like two years before I even resolved the first one. I mean, thousands, 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 thousands. I took thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs and printed out hundreds in a Kate's but She's laughing because she's been there. She's seen the nonsense. And Greg has certainly been there. And it's just like every idea okay, try that out. Just waste a few hundred rolls of film on that dumb idea, you know, like, because you're not going to know until you, and then it's like, well, maybe that idea is good if it's in color. Let me try that bad idea all over again in color this time. Now I'll try it in black. Oh, let me try it larger format. Let me, oh, let me move it closer to the window. Oh, let me put, oh, oh, you know, I never usually use a flash. Why don't I try using a flash? You know, oh, oh I'll try a different, you know, like just, Lynn Cook, who's a dear friend and, and like a very, has been coming to the studio for many years with this project. She came over and she just said, well, Zoe, you're being very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, so, and there were the stacks of books and then I was like, maybe I need to photograph the books. I'll photograph all the books black and white, color, 35 millimeter, six by seven, that whole idea sucked. Oh, but did I print out several hundred of them, hang them up, put them, oh, of course I did. And then one day I was like, yeah, those are just not interesting or good in any way, but I'd wasted six months of my life on it. But then you get to something that you think maybe is good. But um, a, lot of the, a lot of the way the work happens is um, is by just like doing it and and trying out all these different ideas and this particular one I'd been photograph it's it wasn't like it was my favorite snapshot I liked it a lot but um, it just happened to be that day I was playing with that one and then the light was hitting it and I was like huh this is kind of interesting and um, I got that film back and I I started playing with it more, switched to a different camera, and just played with this phenomenon just of the glare and thinking about um, the way that the, the way we've been trained to look at photographs is like you look for the image. And if there's a person, you look for the face, and that's the center of the image. and. So the glare was kind of making it hard to see this subject. But I think there's 
that's not necessarily what the subject is. There's a context that you can see, you can sort of, it, it, this is, you can see it upstairs way better than in like this, you know, reproduction of a reproduction of a reproduction. Um, the, like the shoes, and then there's a double-decker bus. You can tell you're in London. You can sort of tell from the style that it's like the very late 40s or early 50s. There are all these kind of clues to what is in the original image. And then there's also the way that the light hits it allows you to see the kind of wrinkles and cracks, the material life that that snapshot has also had, that it's been moving through the world. Um, and the the kind of desire to see through that glare and that frustration, but it's also really beautiful, at least to my mind, it's like kind of glamorous. It's like, ooh, like shiny, shiny. And so it's like really good looking, but also really frustrating. And and then it's like four times, but they're, they look the same and then they're not the same when you look closer and you can sort of see the ghost of a face. And when this one, when I kind of pared it down and got these four up on the wall, something just, I was like, oh, maybe I'm onto something. Like maybe, maybe this is actually an artwork and I can actually like say yes to the gallery that I can have a show in a year because I think I have something finally. Um, but there was this whole kind of, it was putting into material these questions about disappearing and appearance about erasure, but also about um, looking, looking not only at the subject, but the situation, right? Like what that process is. And my own distance, our distance from a previous generation, um, the desire to have it be a window through which information can flow openly is a false one. We, we, we share histories, we learn things, we read books, um, we look at films, we hear stories, but there isn't like a direct transmission of exactly what happened. And us not knowing everything about what's happened is part of our human experience. And, um, and making that making that evident, um, not you know making it evident that I can't tell you the whole truth about this situation, um, yeah, is a subject in, of itself. I'll end with one last point, but you should respond to this, and then we can really end. Um, <laughs> The show in New York and the show in MoCA are um, very, very different. Uh, different suites of work, uh, whole suites of work were left out uh, in each iteration. And I just want to say that um, in many ways it's always uh, an inspiration and a model for me, but I do not know many or any artists who would have a career retrospective who would show so much control and restraint and sacrifice entire bodies of work so that you could see clearly the bodies of work that are on presentation. And I just want to say that I admire you tremendously for that and that you showed a tremendous amount of courage uh, in both iterations. And both iterations are amazing records of your work and that they're entirely different and the two stand together as a testament to the uh, enormous accomplishment that is your career to date. It's a diptych. It's a diptych. <laughs> Thank you for having a conversation with me. Thank you, guys.